At school, I was always good at science. And if you're good at science at school, they tell you to study medicine. It's a way of using your gifts to help other people, and it makes the school look good. So when I applied to university, that's what I thought I wanted to do. I thought it would be a long degree, followed by a long career path, so I'll take a gap year. And it was in that gap year that I discovered writing and performing poetry. And it felt like nothing else. I couldn't describe it at the time, but I knew this was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I just didn't know how. Unlike medicine, there weren't courses on, is poetry right for you? And I didn't know anyone who had trodden this path before. So I remember sitting down with my parents and saying, Mum, Dad, that's what I call them. <laughs> I figured it out. I want to have enough time to give this poetry thing a go properly, so I'm switching courses. I'm going to study maths. And somehow they understood. <laughs> I figured this way I'd have time to carry on writing alongside my studies. Then after uni, I'd probably have to get a real job. One day, I'd maybe be sitting in the audience of an event like this. I didn't think I'd get to be the one on stage. But I still wasn't sure. I knew that there were 20 people who would love to have my place in medical school, who would be better doctors than I would because they were actually passionate about it. They hadn't just written that in their personal statement. I also knew that if I didn't write my poems, then nobody else would. And for me, that was important. But when comparing poetry and medicine in my head, poetry is a less quantifiable way of saving lives. And I'm a mathematician. Po medicine had certainty. Poetry was a leap of faith. But then I heard a story, and that story turned into a poem, and that poem helps me make up my mind. So this poem is about the story that scientists once proved that bumblebees couldn't fly because they're too fat, <laughs> and they have little wings. But bumblebees can fly, and I love that. I've always liked an underdog. So I wrote this. It's called The Scientist and the Bumblebee. You see, the scientist said the bumblebee couldn't fly. She liked the wing beats per minute or the necessary size, but the bumblebee in her ignorance proved him wrong. She knew that she could fly because she'd flown all along, and now imagine if she'd listened to the man, she might have stopped, given up on the spot, tucked her wings in and dropped. So don't ever let someone tell you what you can't do, because just because it's proven doesn't mean it's true. Bzzz. The bumblebee bumbled. Loving her life, she hums as she flies. Bzzz. The bumblebee fumbled, clumsily stumbled from flower to flower. Bzzz. The bumblebee tumbled, tore through the sky, pulling corkscrews and dives, and then... The bumblebee mumbled, crumbled in front of the queen and her power. Bzzz. The bumblebee grumbled something explicit, discovered she'd be labeled a gimmick, and then... The bumblebee rumbled, desperate to eat that nectar so sweet. The bumblebee humbled her critics, silenced all things scientific, and then zzzz, the bumblebee jumbled her speech. She didn't care because in the air she was free because she was a busy bee. Loved to fly to flowers and visit trees, deliver seeds efficiently, more so than in a breeze, intricate, intimate, meticulous, auxiliary, and gather more honey than any sick MCs. You see, ever since she learned to fly, she earned her stripes. Despite the words of height from learned types, suppressed the urge to fight or turn and hide. Instead, she yearned for sky and birds up high. Her confidence was soaring. She saw scientists as boring, the sort of people she should be ignoring because they made no sense. At least no center sweet as pollen, even centimeters from where they depended on their drawings and they rather follow their charts and follow their hearts. If they saw a bee leave, they'd still believe their graphs. They preferred facts and figures to bees wax and vigor, but she begged to differ. She flew past and laughed. Now meet the scientist. His aim in life was to try and dismiss any hypothesis he deemed preposterous. When asked why he never saw it, his pride, he replied, that's obvious, it wouldn't fit down my esophagus. <laughs> Not quite the optimist, more like the opposite. Less likely to be living in a bubble than popping it. He had, hey, believe everything I say, fever, polynosis when close to the anomalous, taking measurements, making experiments, accumulating evidence. His brain contained considerable cleverness compared to his intelligence, so busy with bees in the room, he forgot the elephant. And his foolproof was foolproof, except for the truth. And if the bumblebee had read his report, she'd have agreed she was too heavy, therefore she'd never be airborne. But ignorance is bliss. And that begins with a B. So this one is for the bees in the hives living lives of aviation. 
The ones who survive and help survive through pollination. The ones that thrive in those sticky situations with their flocky nocky knee hilly pillification. They are doing what they're doing for the buzz. Not for love or money moving and maneuvering above. If the weather's sunny, proving to the humans their conclusions are confusing and unusually refusing to budge. This is for those who are being themselves and who believe in themselves. We see the bee in themselves and set it free in themselves. You know that even though it's difficult, life is full of miracles and true happiness never came from being cynical, the bumblebee. Forever looking for something sweet. Overcoming tumbleweed by holding on to somebody from summary. This is for those that stay summary. And there will be bees to come, whatever comes to be. Because the scientist said the bumblebee couldn't fly. She liked the wing beats per minute or the necessary size, but the bumblebee in her ignorance proved him wrong. She knew that she could fly because she'd flown all along, and now imagine if she listened to the man, she might have stopped, given up on the spot, tucked her wings in and dropped. So don't ever let someone tell you what you can't do, because just because it's proven doesn't mean it's true. Thank you. I believe that words hold power. At school, I was called a buck-toothed, goofy nerd who would never get a girlfriend. Teachers can be cruel. <laughs> I was also told that I was creative, intelligent, thoughtful, kind, brilliant. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> But no matter how inaccurate, no matter how little the person saying them knows you, Words of hatred are very hard to shake off, but somehow I managed to ignore those that were closest to me. When I was 14, the most important thing in the world was getting braces, because I figured that way I could fix my front teeth, and then I could fit in with the other kids. And I remember the day after I got my braces off, I went into school, and I sat in reception smiling, and my mate said, Harry, you look good. And I said, I know. <laughs> but I was most excited for break time, because at break time, I would get to see my best friend. And if anybody was going to be happy for me, it was going to be her. And I remember walking across the playground, smiling and waiting. And she didn't say anything. And I was so disappointed. I couldn't believe that she hadn't noticed. I couldn't believe that she didn't care. And looking back on it, she probably did notice. But she definitely didn't care. She didn't care what I looked like. She didn't care whether I fitted in or not, because she loved me for who I was. And it took me years to fully appreciate that. I'm currently in my final year of university. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do afterwards, but it'll probably involve more poetry than it does maths. I know that it's a path that hasn't been trodden before, but that's what makes it exciting. And I'm learning to listen to those that love me, because those that love you are those that know you best. And those that know you best have the most important things to say. <laughs>